So thank, thanks, everybody, uh, for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, uh, about buildings and building energy efficiency, but I'm going to start uh, by talking a little bit uh, about buildings and airplanes. My mules, um, you know, my examples I'm going to use for this comparison are uh, the Boeing Dreamliner, the 787, uh, and the Ameriprise Financial Center, which is a million square foot office building in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, the reason I chose these two is uh, because they cost roughly uh, the same amount of money. If you have $200 million uh, burning a hole in your pocket, you can get your hands on either one of these. They also have uh, roughly the same uh, uh, time in terms of uh, service lifetime, about 50 years. Each one of those uh, you can get for and, and use for about 50 years. They're each also uh, a very energy efficient example of its, uh, of its type. So the Dreamliner is one of the most energy efficient uh, planes you can get. And the Ameriprise Financial Center has an energy star score of 90. So it's in the 90th percentile of office buildings uh, uh, of this size. Um, of course, being a plane and doing a lot of transatlantic and transpacific uh, trips uh, in terms of emissions per year, uh, the Dreamliner uh, a Dreamliner uh, emits about five times as much CO2 as the uh, Ameriprise Center. A couple of other points uh, to consider is how many comparable uh, uh, instances there are in the U.S. So there are about 6,600 commercial planes in the U.S. And there are about uh, 3,500 office buildings of this size or larger in the U.S. But in terms of exact copies, this is, uh, you know, a irrelevant difference here. There are 1,150 uh, Dreamliners in the world. Actually, only 600 are in operation. The rest are on order. And of course, only one uh, Ameriprise Financial Center. The other office buildings are not exact replicas of it. And so what I'm going to talk today about is how the investment uh, in each of these uh, differs. And I'm going to start by talking about the investment uh, that was used to design, develop, and test these things. So it took eight years to develop the Dreamliner uh, whereas it took about one to design uh, the Ameriprise Financial Center. Uh, it cost about two to three million dollars to design the office buildings, and Boeing spent 32 billion to design um, uh, the 787. Uh, in terms of what fraction of that spend was spent on designing the energy features or the control features, about one percent of the design cost for the office building was spent on designing either the control system or the package of energy conservation measures that were associated with the building. I don't have numbers for uh, what it took to design the energy and control features uh, of the 787, but my guess is it's much, much less, much, much greater than 1% than of the cost of the project. And of course, Boeing went through a whole series of uh, physical prototyping, uh, wind tunnel tests, and other sort of test flights before starting mass production. Whereas uh, no building that I know of goes through such an exercise where you build a test building before you uh, build the actual building. The economics are just, just not there. And this actually continues into the lifetime of the building. If you actually go and research uh, and try to look at what the service schedule or the maintenance schedule and the operation schedule uh, for an airplane is, it, it's, it's outrageous. Uh, there's a five-hour service check that airplanes go through on a daily basis. Every 600 hours of flight time, there's the 150-hour check in which you take the plane out of service for a couple of days and you have a bunch of people inspect it. Every two years, there's, the six, there's what's called the sea check, which is 6,000 hours. You essentially take the plane apart and put it back together. I mean, buildings just don't have you know, service schedules like this. Uh, you know, at most, you maybe have a yearly checkup. Uh, I was going to say audit, but after the last talk, I'm going to start using checkup now. Um, you know, and maybe uh, for servicing, there's a, a walk around by the building manager on a, on a weekly basis. Again, if you look at the kind of instrumentation and the kind of control you have on a plane, the plane is completely instrumented and fully controlled digitally. Uh, the pilots are there, you know, just for, uh, to make the passengers perhaps feel better. Most uh, planes can fly themselves, including takeoff and landing. Uh, buildings do not have that type of sophisticated automation. The one thing which is kind of strange is that in terms of operator training and certification, to be a, uh, a certified energy manager of a building takes about three years, whereas to be a certified commercial pilot also takes about three years. So that was interesting in that those two are, are, are roughly the same. And so w what's interesting here is really the, the, the nature or the ratio in terms of spend on energy, maintenance, and operations. And, and I sort of summarized those in the tables above. 
the energy maintenance and operations spend is much lower for buildings. So it took a thousand times as much money to design the 787 than it did the office building, but that kind of makes sense because of mass production amortization, right? There are a thousand of those planes that will be built, and so it's fine to spend a thousand times more money designing the initial prototype. You're going to stamp out a thousand of them. But even when accounting for this amortization, the spend on energy uh, control and just general servicing is, is really out of whack. And this is true, and the Ameriprise Financial Center is an exemplar of energy efficient buildings. It actually has a dedicated on-site operator. It has a control system. It had a dedicated energy design budget. Buildings that are smaller typically do not have these things. So they just are, you know, kind of left, left to drift. Um, and this is a, a tremendous missed opportunity in terms of energy savings and, uh, and resulting costs because the basic energy efficiency technology for buildings is there. High performance envelopes are there. We have LEDs. We have heat pumps, heat recovery systems. We can put all these together. What's missing really is the analytical piece on a building by building basis, making the determination of what's the best and most cost effective technology package and how should that package sort of how should the various pieces be made to work together. Now, here's, you know, uh, if you want to try to rationalize, you know, what, why, you know, this difference in investment, um, there's here are some things that you, that you may use. So one is, for a plane, the energy part of the plane is a much greater fraction of the total economic asset, right? For a building, 90% of the economic asset is not the building itself or the operation in the building. It's the economic activity that goes on within the building, right? What the people in the building are doing. On a plane, nobody's really doing anything except for watching movies, you know, reading the in-flight magazine, or maybe, you know, checking emails. Right? There's no econ economic activity. The only activity is actually getting the people you know, from A to B, and so the more efficient you can, do that, you can be in doing that, you know, maybe the plane can fly further, you know, maybe you can, uh, you, you can carry less fuel and more people, so on and so forth. So that's one reason. The second one is the consequences of error or, or, uh, or uh, you know, service uh, or maintenance uh, failures. If you fail to maintain you know, the airplane or there's an error by the operator, the result uh, can be a catastrophe, right? And people can lose their lives. If the building operator, you know, makes an error or the building is not serviced properly, the result can be, you know, maybe the occupants can be uncomfortable, maybe some energy is wasted. Now, I contend, you know, that these arguments have fallacies built into them. And one of the fallacies is called the fallacy of exclusion, sometimes also called the fallacy of composition, which means that in the small, in the individual, what you say is true, but aggregated over a large number, the consequences sort of are multiplicative. And the second one is the failure to take into account externalities. And so when you look at all of these together, when you look at both of these together, yes, for an individual building, maybe the economic impact right, of the energy use of that building is not significant, but taken over the entire building stock, it's extremely uh, it's extremely significant and taken in aggregate with the social and environmental costs, right? The result can be a catastrophe, right? Aggregated maintenance and operation errors can and do lead to catastrophes. And here's, you know, it's hard to draw a, a straight line from A to B, but here's the most recent catastrophe. This is a, you know, a flyover picture of a town in Haiti that was just destroyed by Hurricane uh, uh, Matthew. Okay. So what is the challenge here? The challenge is, let's take the kind of analytics that planes have, and let's try to not replicate them, but let's re replicate 10% of them, right? We don't have to do the kind of thorough job that, that's done for planes. We, let's just do 10% of that for buildings. But the challenge is, we have to do this at much less than 1% of the cost if we want it to scale up. And we have to do this not just for the big buildings. In order to make a difference, we have to do this for 90% of the buildings. So what is building analytics? Well, it, it's a number of things, but an important uh, instance of building analytics, an important kind of building analytics, is building energy modeling. And this is uh, physics simulation, software simulation of what the building is doing and how much energy that is consuming. So basically what we're talking about is physics equations that model the heat transfer in the building, the lighting, the airflow, 
what the HVAC system is doing, what the water systems are doing, you know, what the weather outside is. This is actually something, an established discipline. It's been around for 50 plus years. The first programs in this discipline were actually written on punch cards. Uh, this is not a punch card from one of those programs, but just, you know, illustrating the punch cards. So, you know, this has been around for a long time, and it's proven to be a very useful surgical tool. Right? Anytime you have a computer model, you basically have a virtual lab. You can ask it questions, you can run what-if scenarios, you can run various diagnostics. And over the past 50 years, this discipline of building energy modeling has found a large number of use cases. So design of buildings is one of them. It's a very intuitive one. But also checking that the building uh, complies with code, uh, asset rating, like getting a LEED certificate involves a building energy modeling exercise, getting money for utility for an energy efficiency rebate involves a modeling exercise. So these established use cases are these offline use cases where you're taking the building and analyzing it, you know, uh, uh, its annual energy behavior according to typical conditions. And really what they're doing here is using modeling to isolate the building or the building's performance from weather and occupancy effects. Right? You're doing something, you're running an experiment that you can never actually run on the actual building. But there are emerging uses of this as well, and a lot of these have to do with the kind of things that happen in airplanes. There are uses that have to do with diagnostics of what's going on in the building, or with optimally controlling the building in response to weather conditions and grid conditions. So uses like model predictive control, uh, fault detection and diagnostics, and the original design of the control system is also a, a use case. Now, some of you may or may not, may not know this, but DOE has been the leader in research and development in this area for over 40 years, since before it's been DOE. And not only has it done the research, it's also done the development. DOE has funded the development of some of the seminal software programs in this area, and this continues to this day. The big software that's used today, that DOE works on today, is called Energy Plus, and E Plus is, is the symbol for it. So that's what that means over there. And so, what are we doing and, and what are we going to do? It's really a, a, a two-pronged attack that we have here. One for the established use cases and one for the emerging use cases. So for the established use cases, for design, for retrofit, you know, for lead and code compliance, our goal is to take these established use cases and max them out, meaning apply them to the small buildings. Like these things should not be best practices just for lead buildings, you know, in large sort of high profile office buildings. They should be standard practice for every building. The way we do this is by hiding the complexity that's associated with this from all but more the most advanced users. And we automate, 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 right? Anything that the computer can do, right, it should do. The humans, you know, can only, should only be required, you know, to sort of, uh, you know, do the thinking, you know, look, look, do the high level, do the high level things. You know, the tedium that's associated with a lot of this, you know, should be removed. Now, for the, for the second, for the second uh, uh, goal, which is more about control, more about maintenance, right? These use cases are not established, right? People are not doing them right now. And so we have to be a little sneaky. And here's where we sort of go the Trojan horse route. And that's, that's, what the, that's the Trojan horse right there. Not the actual Trojan horse. They didn't have uh, video back then. But what we're going to do is take the workflows that building designers and building managers currently use and slide in this sort of new functionality, this sort of new analytics that allow us to, to sort of uh, uh, insert these features. And specifically, we're going to allow people to sort of start, you know, with a simple, you know, dashboards and analytics that they use today and then give them the opportunity to sort of drill down and get, uh, get a hand on some of these more advanced capabilities, advanced surgical tools. Oops. Okay. So DOE is actively working along both of these, uh, along both of these tacks. In the first one, how are we making uh, established use cases? How are we maxing them out? How are we uh, allowing people to apply them to more and more buildings? Well, a couple of years ago, five or six years ago, we started a new project called Open Studio. Open Studio is, you can think of it as an operating system, like the Windows, or the Linux or the Android for building energy modeling. This may seem like a very simple idea, but in the energy modeling world, it was revolutionary. We just sort of borrowed it from the software world in general. And really what OpenStudio is, is just a set of abstractions 
wrapped into a software library that allows you to embed the logic and the physics and all of the detail into high-level applications. Um, and this, we have found, tremendously reduces the effort required to actually take these capabilities and embed them into the applications that architects and engineers already use. And so, the basics of OpenStudio are, um, are, uh, are this library, which allows application development. We, ha we also have an example application that the National Lab, specifically NREL, built using this library just to demonstrate how you would do this and put together in six months. And so that's, that's shown below here. Now, something else that I wanted to show is that, as it turns out, we started with this vision for OpenStudio, but really the power and the value proposition of the enterprise was something that came as a surprise even to us. And so this library, this API, this collection of abstractions, we gave it a scripting layer. Just like in Microsoft Excel, you have Visual Basic and you can sort of write off little macros. We basically gave OpenStudio the same thing and allowed people to write you know, little macros so that they can automate processes that they wanted. And this thing has absolutely taken off. So the initial use was people using these scripts to automate the transformations that have to do with energy conservation measures. And as a result, the scripting facility got the name Measures, or OpenStudio Measures. And so one of the come to OpenStudio graphics that I like to use is this before and after image of the OpenStudio daylighting measure. So here is a picture of a school, right? It's the ASHRAE school prototype building. This is the standard one that you get from ASHRAE. The one that's shown below is the same school after the daylighting measure has been applied to it. If you're somebody who knows stuff about passive design, right, knows stuff about daylighting, you can see, you can interpret some of the things that have happened here that this script did to the model, right? The east-west windows have been removed. These don't help with lighting. They just sort of add glare, and they had thermal gain and loss. You know, the south-facing windows have been sort of raised and reconfigured so that, you know, they give more useful light, you know, per area. There's shading. Uh, there are skylights. There's stuff that you can't see, like sensors and controls in there. And so this is sort of one very powerful example, but people have taken this absolutely everywhere. It's not just for transforming the model. It's for doing visualizations, for doing QA checks. It's for automation. So when I said before, one of the ways to bring this to more and more projects is to automate as much of this as possible. And something else that this feeds into is that OpenStudio also has a cloud image called OpenStudio Server. So this is not just something that you can run on your own machine. It's something you can throw up into the cloud and run a bunch of simulations, right, to do large studies, either for a single building or maybe you want to study an entire service territory. What really is the challenge in doing a large-scale simulation study? Well, it's creating the variants that you want to study, creating the different models so that you can subsequently compare them. Well, measures provide a very concise way of creating all these variants, a very systematic way. And so people have taken this and used it for optimization, uncertainty quantification, calibration. I want to show an example that didn't actually come from labs. It came from a hackathon that we did last October. You know, and this is something that two students, I believe that they were from Hunter College, did over the course of uh, 18 hours in a hackathon uh, in New York. It uses a JavaScript library to, in your browser, display a movie of the surface temperatures of the building as they change throughout the day. So you're taking the results of the simulation and mapping them, sort of movie style, onto, uh, you know, onto your model. So this is just kind of a visualization and a design aid the 200 college students put together in 18 hours using this OpenStudio framework. So let's go back to the presentation now. And so, you know, this is why, this is why I like to call, you know, when I say that OpenStudio measures are, you know, are, are hotcakes, I think they're, they've surpassed hotcakes to the point, to the, uh, at this point, and I think that hotcakes need to officially be renamed uh, OpenStudio measures. So, is, is this working? Um, can I click forward now? Or, oops. Yes, it is working. So this strategy 
has really uh, made an impact. So before Open Studio came along in 2011, when we just had Energy Plus, we had about 5,000 users, about 5,000 uh, downloads per version, and there were only two end user applications, graphical applications that use Energy Plus uh, inside. Five years later, we now have uh, 35,000 users, 35,000 downloads per application, and we, per uh, version update, and we have a much greater number of applications, uh, applications for single building model development, for portfolio scale analysis, uh, I'm going to delete auditing, uh, applications for commercial and residential building checkups, for code compliance, for asset ratings, uh, plugins for design tools, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, tools for utility program administration. And just to show that we're actually hitting the target that we tried to hit initially, here is this utility program administration. It's called EDEPT. And using Open Studio, this is something that was developed by Excel Energy of Colorado. Using these tools, Excel Energy of Colorado, their design assistance program, which used to only be available to buildings 75,000 square feet and greater, primarily because of cost effectiveness, is now, now they're providing it for buildings 20,000 feet and uh, square feet and greater, right? Applying these same tools to smaller and smaller buildings. Okay, very quickly, the second goal. So we're doing this reach, we're maxing out the, the established use cases. What are we doing with the new use cases? Well, the new use cases that have to do more with online applications, with control and with maintenance, have to do less with the interface, less with the abstractions, and more with the engine itself. And here's where we've kind of reached, uh, you know, the limits of the current tools. And so what we're doing, uh, this is where sort of energy plus stops and we need something else. So what we're doing is we've rebooted kind of a Skunk Works parallel project, which internally we call Spawn of Energy Plus, and hence, you know, this uh, little alien thing that I, I cribbed from somebody from DeviantArt, you know, the alien that comes out of you know, the, the, the guy's uh, chest in the movie. And ironically, what Spawn is, is a re-implementation of Energy Plus using the simulation technology that was developed by the aerospace industry. Those same guys that spent $32 billion designing the 787, as it turns out, also developed very flexible and powerful tools for, for modeling the 787 and all of its systems, for building the control systems, you know, for wiring everything together. These things have subsequently been taken and adopted, not just be, by the aerospace industry, but also the automotive industry, so they've been generalized. And rather than sort of reinventing that wheel, what we're doing is just borrowing it. Let's just take all the great stuff that uh, the aerospace industry has done and use it and apply it to buildings. And we're really looking forward to applications that uh, will allow us to do some of the same stuff that's happening in aerospace and buildings, such as writing a control algorithm in a language, being able to simulate its effects, and then taking that exact control algorithm, that same piece of code, dropping it in the building and having it run in the building. Right? The same thing that's being modeled is now, there's, there's no need to re-implement in the building or to reinterpret. It's the same thing. The building and the model sort of are, you know, have the same view of each other and speak the same language. So this is something that we're currently working on, and we hope uh, we have an alpha uh, version of this, and we hope a beta will be uh, available in about 18 months. And of course, this is you know something very sophisticated. You know how are we going to bring it to the masses? Well, we have the Trojan horse. We have the Trojan Open Studio. So we're just going to you know stick it into the, our Open Studio Trojan horse, and 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 go from there. And I'm going to end by borrowing uh, one more. Uh, one more thing from the aerospace industry, which are the sort of the dual um, sort of analogies of an airplane taking off and uh, the analogy of, uh, you know, which sounds scary, but, you know, we're doing it, which is uh, changing out the engines of the plane while, while it's in flight. So, you know, here, here's what we're doing. We have our Open Studio airplane and we're change, changing one of the engines uh, to the spawn. And so if you want to learn about any of this, we have a very detailed website. And uh, thank you.